Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. My name is Jewel Ratzlaff and I'm with the Poughkeepsie Public Library District. And this is, <clears throat> let me think, the uh, four, five, six, seventh in our series of programs called On Becoming Nature's Best Hope. This series was inspired by the Doug Talame book, Nature's Best Hope. And if you haven't had a chance to uh, read the book, I definitely would recommend it. So uh, we have a poll up on your screen. Hopefully you can answer the poll questions, just trying to figure out if we can pull off some garden visits, how we might do that. So that's why I'm asking some questions about participation. We do need to keep the groups small. So we would divide the group up into uh, small groups and see what we can do, uh, if we can make it happen. <clears throat> So before I introduce our guest tonight, Brent Boscarino, um, I am going to just review for you a little bit uh, where we're headed in terms of April and May. I had thought that maybe our series would be done tonight, but uh, everyone was so eager to continue, gave me great suggestions for upcoming programming. So we will continue. So in April, we have two programs scheduled on April 7. Now, all of you don't have to write this down. You're going to get information tomorrow in your email. Um, but we do have um, the registrations also are online. So you can sign up for these programs. And I'll just quickly tell you, we've got a Climate Smart Community Program coming up April 7. We have a bird program coming up on April 28. We have in between those two, it seems like a big gap. Well, that's because on Thursday, April 22nd, there is a special program that you might be interested in called Planting a Garden for Pollinators. And the guest speaker will be from the Cornell Cooperative Extension. So I didn't want to schedule a program on Wednesday night and then have this pollinator program on Thursday night. I thought that was a little too much in one week. So I pushed off our meeting to the following week. That's why the dates are a little funky. <clears throat> and then in May, uh, May 12, we have how to plant native plants. Uh, we've got Peter Morosky of the uh, Native Landscapes and Garden Center in Pauling, who's going to be with us. He, um, his, his uh, garden center focuses on native plants for our area. So he'll be able to answer all kinds of great questions for you about native plants. And then on May 26, we're gonna be talking about the 30 by 30 initiative <clears throat> with uh, some guests from Vassar College. So we've got a lot coming up and uh, I'm excited to see where this, uh, where this all goes. So, I am at this point going to introduce Brent Boscarino. He is with the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference. He is a citizen science coordinator, and he sure seems to know a lot about invasive plant species. So uh, I am going to end the poll, and then I'm also going to just turn things over to him. Thank you so much for your answers in the poll. I appreciate your feedback. And so we're going to take it away, Brent. Thanks, Jewel, for that introduction. And I just want to say thank you to everyone who made it out tonight. Um, it's good to see so many people and it, excited to learn. So um, hopefully you'll get something out of this and uh, happy to be a part of it. Uh, you know, I work for the New York, New Jersey Trail Conference, and uh, many of you might not know what that organization is. So I just want to do a little bit of an introduction as to what we do. Um, we develop, build, maintain trails throughout the Lower Hudson Valley, as well as Northern New Jersey as well. We do a lot of advocacy work, um, as well as edu educating the public. So we run webinars like this, we're out um, within the parks and doing education and outreach. But many people who know the trail conference may, may not even know that we also help to coordinate the regional response to invasive species. And my role in that process is to basically like inspire action. 
So to take that knowledge that you've got, that love for the outdoors or the love for gardening, whatever, whatever strikes your fancy for being outdoors and wanting to be outside, and then take it to the next level to get out there, learn about what you're seeing while you're out hiking, walking, gardening, whatever, and then contribute some data um, that can help us make management decisions. So I work with a whole bunch of people of all different ages, um, young, you know, up to retired, you know, master gardeners who just want to give back and, and learn about uh, what they're seeing while they're out outdoors and hiking and stuff. So those are those are the sorts of things that we do. Um, I focus on invasive species in particular, and all our volunteers that I work with help to report invasive species in our regions so that we can help, we can make management decisions together. And it's a collective effort. It's wonderful. We have a great volunteer base. We have over 2,000 active volunteers at the trail conference and about, about 150 of those volunteers help us with invasive species um, distribution and management. Before we get too much farther into the talk though, I wanted to define a few things. So you might see these terms bandied around a little bit, not non-native versus invasive. What's the, what's the difference? So a non-native species is essentially one that has evolved in another area. It might be another part of the United States or North America, or it could be from an entirely different continent that was essentially brought here and not by natural movement. It was brought here by human means. To get to the level, however, of considered invasive, it really has to cause some sort of ecological damage, at least in, in terms of what we are talking about, or uh, economic damage even. So it's, it gets to the level of interfering with biodiversity of our native species that have evolved in this region for you know, thousands, if not millions of years, right? So it's something that's brought to this area and is decreasing biodiversity and having some sort of like environmental or economic or even like a human health harm. So that's what it takes to get to the level of invasive. Um, I'm gonna start, I know a lot of you guys are plant, plant folks, but we are really pushing an effort to be on the lookout for one type of invasive species that's moving into our area and really impacting our plants. And I'm talking about gardens, trees, um, really can be an ecosy ecosystem game changer. So I'm gonna focus on spotted lanternfly, which is the, at the beginning of this talk here, and then we'll move on to the plants and also how spotted lanternfly uses a host tree that's also an invasive plant. So this is what that species looks like as an adult. They're actually very pretty. They're about the size of my, like a little bit bigger than my thumbnail, maybe an inch across. And they go through these different stages of development with these really nice colors. But in areas of infestation, they're causing a lot of different problems. It's an invasive plant hopper. And the way I want you to think about what a plant hopper is, is imagine it's like a grasshopper that can fly. <laughs> it has a little bit of a, a flying capability, but really kind of moves from one place to another by hopping around. It's native to China and Vietnam, but was introduced to our area here in the Northeast, in Pennsylvania in particular, in 2014. It probably was brought over on, um, you know, in, uh, on stone slabs. So brought over by accident and either their legs or the adults were just brought in on stone slabs and then escaped into the environment. The thing is why it's so devastating is that it can feed on a host, 70 different host species. Its primary host, which we'll get to in a second, is tree of heaven. You might have seen it around you. It's also called Alanthus. It's, a, it's very pervasive in our area and we'll get to like how to ID tree of heaven in a second. But not only is it really kind of like throwing, um, you know, vineyards and other, you know, other things that it feeds on. I mean, it, it feeds on apples, vineyards, all sorts of different host trees, all sorts of shade trees, 70 different host species. But it's also an agronomic pest. So this has devastated um, a lot of industry in Pennsylvania. We're really trying to do the best we can to keep this out of New York State and expanding and causing problems like it has in Pennsylvania. I just wanna show you, this is where spotted lanternfly originally was introduced. It was in Reading, Pennsylvania. And as of a year ago, that area had expanded to include a lot of quarantine of a lot of the counties in, in Pennsylvania and then Western New Jersey. But as of you know March of 2020, it still hadn't made its way into New York state. There was no viable population in New York state. You can see that you found like an individual here and there. You see these dots in some of the counties in New York state on this map. 
there were, that there was just like an individual here, maybe probably brought over on like a truck or something where there was no population. But what's happening is that this is expanding from that initial area of infestation and has now been found in Staten Island and in our southern part of what is considered our prism region or area that we are managing in the lower Hudson Valley. And we've now found spotted lanternfly and their eggs in Port Jervis, Slotesburg, Orangeburg, and Ithaca. And it's not found up here in Dutchess County yet. And we really need to keep it that way, guys. And that's why hopefully you're here to learn a little bit about it and how it's influencing and impacting plants in areas where, it, that, where it's uh, infested. So just a little bit of a background on spotted lanternfly biology. So I've been to areas in which there's been these infestations. I, I visited them in the fall time, and that's when they're these really pretty kind of flying insects stage um, in late fall, um, early, you know, early winter. And they start laying their eggs at the end of the fall period. So right now in our area and in the Lower Hudson Valley, Northern New Jersey and Pennsylvania area, they have laid their eggs. And those leg, eggs are just waiting there dormant and about to hatch, like literally within a month. And when they first hatch, a couple of different things happen. They come out and they look like little, uh, kind of like cute polka dot beetles. They're very, very small. And it's at that point in which they're feeding on succulent new growth. And I've talked to gardeners and outdoors uh, folks that are down in Pennsylvania, and they will find them on, on any, like lots of different types of garden plants. So they're roses, they're viburnums, they're peonies in their vegetable gardens. They're feeding on all parts of newer growth, the leaves and stuff of those plants when they're young. And they go through these different stages of development. Those are called instars. So they're bugs, right? They have to like shed their exoskeleton and that's how they end up growing. So they start in this like black polka dot phase and then they eventually turn in around on like late summer, they turn this nice brilliant red color until they eventually grow wings. And then that's when they start like feeding on like really mature trees and they can feed on the tree trunk. They'll be found up in the branches. They're found uh, feeding all, basically all over the plant at that point and on 70 different host species, not just new succulent growth close to the ground like you might find in your garden or the understory of a forest but they're feeding up in the canopy of trees um, and just basically essentially like sucking out the sap from these things. Um, they like to hitchhike. Probably the reason or how they're going to be getting from one place to another is by what is called like hitchhiking on vehicles. So if you're in a region in Pennsylvania where there's these large infestations, they're probably gonna be moving into our area by laying their egg masses, as you see here, they're almost like putty, and we'll get into that in a second, on things like wheel wells. The adults will also hitchhike in, in under wheel wells and on your cars. We actually have a pretty cool part of our team that is called the conservation dogs. And these are dogs that are trained to sniff out spotted lanternfly egg masses and also invasive plants in our area. So they're helping us out. But in areas in which they are quarantined um, in Pennsylvania, any sort of distribution center or, or um, plants that is shipping goods in or out of that quarantine area, they need to inspect their goods. So like stone slabs like this, uh, vehicles that are moving in and out of there. And I'm telling you, it is really bad in Pennsylvania right now but we are at an early detection stage here in New York State and that's why we need your help to identify them. Do you see this picture here? That is like what's happening in Pennsylvania right now. That is thousands of adult spotted lanternfly at the base of a tree in someone's backyard. It is a prolific reproducer. So we're talking about for every one adult spotted lanternfly can reproduce and replace itself in one year. It has one year generation cycle 17 times. It has very few natural predators. So we have found that the things like praying mantis that we that you kind of like to see in your backyards probably, spiders getting caught in spider webs, um, some birds, particularly chickens on farms and stuff will feed on them, but not nearly at the level that we need to control their population and areas infestation. This is what those adults will look like when they spread their wings, you'll see that there's a little bit of a reddish underside to that kind of pink polka dot look to it. So when those wings are not expanded, you'll see that it's just like, they look like bugs in a lot of them in infested areas. And because they're a plant generalist, they're very, very successful um, at reproducing and they're feeding on whatever's around them. Um, the question is, you guys are probably plant enthusiasts in, in this uh, talk tonight. 
So how is it actually impacting plants? As I mentioned before, they're sap suckers. And this is a horrifying image of something up close of a spotted lanternfly, but that's what it looks like when you really zoom into it. You see this mouth part here? It's a really expanded mouth part, like that it essentially inserts into the sides of plants. So this is tree trunks when it's an adult and succulent new growth. And it sucks out the sap that is basically providing the nutrients and the water and basically it's coming up from the roots and intercepting that and starving out these trees. They will feed on the nymph stage, that younger stage and adult stage. But essentially they're taking in so much of that sap and that goodness, that kind of sticky substance in those plants that they just, they can't take it all in at once. So they secrete what is called a honeydew solution, which is a sticky sugar water out their back end. And people who have been in these infested areas, like you're seeing in this previous slide here, it's just like raining down from the trees. If you've ever seen a gypsy moth infestation where they're like raining down frass or something, imagine sticky honeydew raining down from trees. So college campuses in Pennsylvania, you can't have picnics outdoors anymore or in your backyard. So it's, it's really bad there. And then, so how is that impacting our plants? Well, in an area of infestation with spotted lanternfly, what ends up happening is all that sugar water falls to the bottom of the tree and on the leaves of the understory of that tree. That is like, imagine that like that sugar water is a, it's like a medium for growth for things like sooty mold and, and fungus. So what you, what you see is like, uh, it's blocking out photosynthetic properties of the understory um, and growing like fungus beneath it. Um, you're getting dieback of a lot of the treasured native understory plants that we're seeing in forests, as well as your own backyard. So you see all of this blackness here as a sooty mold that grows because of that sugar water that's raining down from the tree. Um, so what, why should you care as a property owner? Well, you know, first of all, in a lot of these areas of infestation, that sugar that they're putting out their other end attracts other things like wasps and bees. So they tend to go together. So that's not something you probably want on your own properties. That sooty mold and their egg masses are found all you know, along porches, um, you know, playing, playground equipment, camping chairs, whatever. They'll lay their eggs on whatever is around. And that sooty mold is growing um, on properties as well. And I mentioned before that it's an economic and agronomic pest. So it is reported if it continues to expand in Pennsylvania like it already has, you're looking at $324 million of annual loss due to crop damage. And that's primarily through vineyards, which we know is also big business, uh, vineyards and apple orchards in New York State. So this is something we really need to pay attention to. The hops industry is also building itself up in New York State as well. So these are things that are not just causing environmental harm, but real economic damage. Um, currently, the losses in Pennsylvania are up to 50 million just on the counties in which it's a high infestation level. So this is something to be mindful of. You can see in this picture, those are all adult spotted lanternfly within, uh, in one single apple tree. This is all of them at the base of a vineyard and, and vineyard. So this is something to definitely be uh, mindful of. Now, everything I'm showing you right now is from areas of like severe infestation. And I want to leave you with some hope. It looks bad, but do not despair. First of all, it's no human health threat. They don't bite, they don't transmit disease, and they're not really like a huge property damage threat. So think like termites that would eat up your home. They won't do that. Even stink bugs, which are also like a real nuisance pest, they get into your house and they'll like poop all over your like curtains and stuff. At least spotted lanternfly will stay outside, right? And they tend to really gather and hunker down around what is called a hot tree. So they'll really focus in, they really are attracted to each other and forming clumps. And so they'll really kind of all gather around one tree in particular, in a particular area, as opposed to just being everywhere. So, th so that's another thing to be thinking about. And they don't generally kill larger trees. Um, yes, they may impact your garden, um, and let some of the lower ones, especially in the nymph stage and adult stage, but they won't, don't typically kill big trees. And the other thing I wanna leave you with is a graphic, and this goes to all invasive species in general, uh, or the you know, non-native ones that are kind of influencing. This area where we're operating is in Pennsylvania, right? Where time has gone by, it was too slow to act, 
And now there's a ton of them in the environment. And so long-term control measures are there. They are really expensive in the millions of dollars to control, right? And they're widespread and it's a total disaster there right now. But here's the hope, guys. We here in New York State are in what is called the early detection rapid response window of opportunity. And if we act by knowing what to look for and being those boots on the ground to be on the lookout for these egg masses, we can really make a difference and costs can be very, very low and uh, eradication and that rapid response can be very, very effective. And so if there's one lesson to be learned from Pennsylvania, when you talk to people there, they said, I really wish we had acted sooner and gotten the word out because if we had, we would have been able to control this. And that's where we're at right now, guys. So what can you do as citizens and homeowners? Well, first of all, how do you identify the spotted lanternfly egg masses, right? So right now they're in a dormant stage and now is the time to act. You can see how that when they first lay their egg masses, it comes out like a white, but it very, very quickly will turn to like, almost like a spackle, a color, like a brownish color to it, okay? And it's like, I imagine like you take a, a peanut butter and you spread it on something. It's not that brown, but it has that sort of like feel to it, especially after a little while, it might start to get a little cracked. Um, but it's imagine like there's a thickness of it to, to like, like peanut butter or like a putty material, like you're laying down putty on your wall or like spackle or something. This is a look at what the spotted lanternfly egg masses look like. Imagine it's about the size of my thumb, okay, across, so a couple inches across and maybe one inch wide. Um, this is actually two what are called covered egg masses right next to each other. You can see that it's glistening. So when they first lay that covering on top of their egg masses, it can come out glistening. Um, but it doesn't always have to be. It can be dry and cracked as well. You may also see their egg masses come out as what are called like these little like rice grains that are next to one another. Sometimes they're exposed like that and they're not don't have this added layer of covering on the top. That's what exposed egg masses look like. And when those nymphs, those little babies hatch out, they like open up a little door and they come crawling out of that. And that's why you can see, it looks like there's like a little slit in that hole there. So I'm gonna show you actually a video of what, of what this looks like in a second. So you can see for my frame of reference, there's my thumb, okay? So you can see about the scale that we're looking at here. As I'm touching it, you can see that my thumb is making like a bit of an indent on that, but it's like, you know, it's fairly soft, you know, it's like, um, it's like, uh, it, it feels like putty that's on like a branch. Okay, so that's what you're looking for. It's about an inch wide and about a couple inches across. So as I'm scanning down this branch, you can also see that over time, right, that as it dries out, just like if you let you left your peanut butter or something out all night, it would get a little dry and maybe a little bit cracked. This is what the, um, whoops, that's what the exposed egg masses look like. Remember that they're like little rice grains that are next to each other. Um, and that is what an exposed egg mass where that covering, that putty covering is not on top of it, right? And so like you might tend to see a little bit of cracking with age. This is actually another example of those little rice grains of an uncovered egg mass, right? And there's a covered egg mass next to it. So those are the sorts of things to be on the lookout for in our region, okay? So that's what the egg masses look like. Um, I'm gonna take questions in a second, but I wanted to get to, okay, well, where do I look? Like, how do I know where to look? They could be, they could lay those eggs anywhere. Basically they like and prefer to lay their eggs on the undersides of branches, on trailheads, if, you're, if you like visiting your uh, parks, on guardrails, whatever. But in terms of their life cycle, they really prefer the plants and which is another invasive plant that I wanna focus on today and how do ID because this is, it's critical. So not only in terms of spotted lanternfly, but also because it's really pervasive in our area and cause all, a host of problems. It's called tree of heaven. And you may, you may identify it or think it's a sumac, right? So if you ever seen sumac on the side of the street, it's, it's very pervasive on like roadsides and stuff like that. But tree of heaven is slightly different. So right now there's no leaves on the trees. So you're not gonna be able to identify it. But um, like 
tree of heaven has these, what are called these compound leaves. There are these huge leaves that are like one to three feet long and they have these leaflets next to them. And those leaflets come out opposite of one another. You see how I'm pointing to this leaflet here and then there's one right opposite of, of itself right next to it. If anyone who's tried to remove tree of heaven in their backyard, if you like crunch up the leaves on it or you try to cut it down, you'll notice that it smells. It smells a little bit like burnt rubber or like a or like a burnt peanut butter smell to it. Okay, so that is what Tree of Heaven, when in, during the growing season, looks like. It's got this big compound leaves to it, paired leaflets next next to it as well, and kind of an unpleasant odor when crushed. Um, out, and the reason why it's different than say like a sumac is if sumac leaves look very very similar to it. Okay, but the main difference is its fruit. You know you're looking at a sumac if you've got those like if you look at your um, this picture here it's got those fruit droops on it that are kind of fuzzy and uh, like a lot of the sumacs I have a kind of like a fuzzy antler sort of appearance to it. Tree of Heaven does not have that right it, it just has instead it has what are called these winged samaras and that's its seed. The seed of a sumac, of most of the sumacs around here are these fruit droops. The, the problem with what I'm showing you right now is that you're not gonna see any of this because there's no leaves out. So how do you identify its main host tree of heaven in the winter time when there, you don't have these other cues to it? And there's a couple of different things that I wanna show you as to how to, whoops, how to identify tree of heaven during the winter time. I just gotta shift things around on my screen. And this is how to identify tree of heaven. And in this, in this picture here, you're going to see that it's called tree of heaven because essentially it grows straight up to heaven. It's got really, really narrow trunk typically and almost has like a palm tree like look to it when it has its leaves on. You see how it's like a very palm tree um, with its compound leaves up here and very narrow, narrow trunk, okay? But how do you identify it in the winter? That's the real, that's the real tricky part. So I'm gonna bring you through a couple of different things to think about. To help determine where to really focus our efforts in looking for these spotted lanternfly egg masses. One of the things you can look for in Tree of Heaven in the winter time is its bark. And a lot of people liken the bark of Tree of Heaven, especially a mature Tree of Heaven like this, to the rind of a cantaloupe. And you can feel as my hands feel this surface here, it's you see how it looks like a cantaloupe, a mature tree of heaven. It's like has that feel to it where it's like you can see some ridges, feel some ridges to it. And it's got that coloration as well. It's got some ridges to it, but it's relatively smooth. It's just like a little bit of a ridge to it, like the outside rind of a cantaloupe. And it even has that coloration to it as well. So the mature trees will have that appearance to it. But I'm also in this region on the edge of a park here um, near the roadway because I wanted to show you what the leaf scars look like of some of the younger tree of heaven. And I want to define what a leaf scar is. You remember those big palm tree like looking leaves that it has those big compound leaves? Well, they fall off in the in the fall, right? And when they fall off, they actually leave behind a scar on the trunk or branches of trees. And so when I refer to a leaf scar, it means like what is left behind after the leaf falls off. And you might see these sticking up uh, on roadside, but one of the ways that I remember it is if we zoom in and it kind of focuses in on my thumb here, that's what the leaf scar of a tree of heaven will look like. And one way that I remember that is when you think of tree of heaven, heaven love, the leaf scars kind of resemble a little heart shape or almost like a little... Sh you see this little heart shaped thing that's underneath like what is new the new bud? And I think about it, it's like heart shaped maybe or like Maybe if you looked at it upside down, it's almost like Pac-Man that's eating the bug, the bud or something. So that's one way to think Field of it. Field shape under it. You can see that the bud of this is just above the main leaf scar here. And remember that huge compound leaf falls off in the fall and leaves behind this scar uh, behind. And it kind of has that heart shape appearance to it. You'll also notice that a lot of the young tree of heaven have lenticels on her, these little white bumps. So as you can see around me here, as we look at some of the other leaf scars that'll start coming into focus, they kind of a variation of that heart shape and um, you know, kind of have a tannish color to them. Some of them will be almost redder, like a reddish green or like an olive color to them. And so be on the lookout for those bumpy lenticels on some of the um, you know smaller tree of heaven that are growing beneath it. 
Here's a look at a really mature tree of heaven. You can see just how tall this can be, multiple stories high. And that's part of the reason why it's got its name tree of heaven, because it because of its fast growth rate, almost straight up towards heaven. You can again take a look at the cantaloupe rind kind of bark on it. So when it's dry, it does have that sort of like cantaloupe appearance to it. But here's a wetter side of the tree. I'm going to zoom ahead to something because I want you to see like what the branches also look like. So what I like to think of is the branches on Tree of Heaven almost look like little arthritic fingers to it. They're, they're thick and stubby and they kind of point up. So that's another key feature to be looking for in the winter, but it's really the leaf scars and that cantaloupe rinds look to it um, that you're going to really be focusing on for in the winter time. Okay. And um, the only other thing that I want to point out is that in this time of year, you can also look for those winged Samaras, but in the winter time, um, you know, they, they can actually persist on a tree. And the, the, the seeds of it are those winged Samara seeds. They almost look like little eyeballs. You see how they, they're like the kind of oblong and with, the, with the seed in the middle? They look like eyeballls. And essentially, you might see this clumping in the, in the, in the branches of Tree of Heaven um, where the seeds tend to stay together and haven't fought, yet fallen off the tree. So at that point, at this point, I want to open this up for questions, either on Spotted Lanternfly or on Tree of Heaven, and then we'll get into some of the other common invasive plants in our region and things to be on the lookout for in terms of invasive plants. But let's stop and pause there for a second. People have questions on this part. Oh, Julia, you're on mute. Sorry, uh, I have no questions in the chat at the moment. So is there anyone, uh, I have a hard time seeing everybody. So, okay, Mary, Mary has a question. No, I just have a comment. Um, I thought I had an Alanthus out back, but it took some binoculars to it and turned out it had black walnuts on it. So that's also ah. a very similar tree. It is, you're absolutely right. And um, yeah, the walnut tree is often mistaken because of those paired, the paired leaves or whatever. So they actually, Tree of Heaven will has a little gland at the base of it that smells. And that's another way to tell, like if you can actually reach it. You can also smell it when it's blooming, it stinks. Yeah, and um, the other way is that uh, walnuts and a lot of the others, including sumacs have serrated leaf margins, but a Tree of Heaven is smooth. It's like, there's no, there's no bumps on the outside of the leaves. Uh, All right, so we, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Mary. There's a lot of Alanthus along the rail trail. Yeah. That's where I've seen it. Okay. Um, so we have a question about, should we scrape the egg masses off? Should we photograph and report? And how do we get rid of that tree? Right, so uh, the, ba the bottom line is that in New York State, since it's at an early stage of infestation, they, it's just early detection and reporting. So if you find a suspected egg mass, um, you, there's actually a program that I'll put up on my screen right now um, for, whoops, is, uh, I thought I, I thought I put it, yeah, if you're interested in volunteering to search for Spotted Lanternfly and Tree of Heaven, you can get started on uh, by emailing us at invasives at nynjtc.org. I'll leave that up as I'm talking, because right now we need to know where the populations are in New York State. So before you actually remove the egg masses, please photograph it, send it in, and then immediately I'm telling you we have a rapid response team ready to go like the next day that you report it. We'll be at that site to check it out. It's, it's a huge effort in New York State right now. So right now, do not scrape the egg masses. We want to be sure that it is what it, what it is, and we will get on site to, to check it out. Right in New Jersey and in Pennsylvania, yes, scrape the egg masses. Um, it's, it's recommended using like a credit card or something to scrape them into a plastic bag, douse it with either alcohol or hand sanitizer, and then, just, and then zip it up, put it in a landfill. Hmm. Um, okay. In terms of Tree of Heaven, yeah, the, uh, the hack and squirt method is probably the best way to go because there, it's a colony tree. So if you cut it down and then just leave it, it sends a stress signal to the roots that essentially start shooting up those young, remember I, I showed you those little like, those young saplings up with the leaf scars on it, it it'll, it'll increase uh, exponentially. If all you do is try to chop it down and don't, uh, and don't do anything else, like you'll be 
forever pulling out the young saplings. Um, so really, this is one of those things where uh, probably using like a chemical is the, is the best way to go for controlling tree of heaven. Hack and spray is what's recommended. Okay, hack and spray. You can find that on, on YouTube. Um, one, more, one more question and then we're gonna go on to other invasive species. Okay. Is there someone else? Somebody else have a question? Someone asked about the- yes, David. Yeah. David, go ahead. You gotta unmute David, hold on. Yes, um, I've been, I have a large piece of property. I've been fighting Alanthus for years. Um, I started out hundreds and hundreds of them. A couple of comments. They're very opportunistic. They're fast growing. They make very little investment in their solidity of their trunk. They're all about vertical growth. So one way to identify them is the growth tends to be somewhat sparse, like a sumac or a warm, walnut compared to a regular shade tree. They also, this is my experience, of course, um, like a lot of trees, they want the sunlight. And so they're going to be prominent around the edges and such, wherever they can grab sunlight. Um, and one thing about those small, if, if they're less than an inch, they're easy to break. Um, because if you cut a full-size trunk, you will get a lot of sprouts. They do multiply but they don't necessarily have to be sprayed. I find that though, if I get to them quickly, I can break them and it'll kill them. Yep. Yeah, you just have to stay on top of it. You can definitely do it by manual means, but like they, it, it will immediately sprout up. But if you stay on top of it and are diligent, you can make progress on it. Absolutely. And um, someone also asked about the, the I didn't focus. I, I purely focused on winter ID because we need people out there looking for it right now. But yeah, I mean, the leaves, the leaves are really, that is the way to ID, ID them. It's just that there's no leaves right now. So that's why I focused on the winter ID for, for the time being. Right, right. Yep. Okay, go ahead, Brent. I think we need to keep moving uh, right. to the rest of your presentation. Okay, so the other ones that I wanted to talk about that are, that are pretty prevalent in our area, let me see if I can get back, is, uh, and probably you guys have seen around, are Japanese barberry. And it's a deciduous compact, thorny shrubbed, uh, sorny shrub, arching branches. This is his picture right here. It is probably one of the most devastating shrubs to our forest ecosystems right now. Um, it's pervasive, very hard to get rid of. It's uh, defined by its thorns, which I'll point out in a video in a second, and, and, it's, and it's red berries. So Japanese barberry, um, you know, it's commonly seen just like tree of heaven, right? They're found on edges oftentimes commonly seen in waste places, roadsides, but they form very, very dense thickets, you know, um, and found in disturbed woodlands, but really have been found like even deep into forests at this point, because uh, they can grow in closed canopies and wetlands. Uh, and they're, or they're a problem, not just because of how fast it spreads, but they also provide nesting habitat for things like birds and small mammals. And they're really like a harbor of ticks so it's so dense in there that it kind of provides like a little small microclimate for ticks and, and small mammals to really like build up their, um, to build up their population. Um, they will rapidly displace native plants, uh, often, often forming monocultures. They can, they're also alterers of soil pH and can reduce uh, leaf litter on the floor. So lots of reasons to not like Japanese barberry and it's a very, very popular um, ornamental shrub that people have put on their properties. And just because you have it on your property and you're like, well, it's not expanding from there. Remember, birds are visiting these things and they're spreading their seed, they're feeding on the berries and then spreading their seeds out into the forest. And now it's completely taking over um, forest understory in a lot, of the, a lot of the different areas in our region. Um, the reason why it's, it's such invasive success, um, deer tend to stay away from barberry. It's got really sharp thorns. Uh, it's very difficult to eat the leaves. It doesn't have a lot of nutritional value. Even birds that are feeding on them um, may have negative impacts on their growth because it doesn't, have a, it doesn't have a high nutritional value to it. They're very disease resistant, so there aren't like a lot of natural controls. And because you know, again, the berries are very tempting. They tend to persist in the winter and sometimes it's the only food source 
And so these berries will tend to spread. Um, like many of the invasive shrubs and stuff, you know, they leaf out very early and manage to maintain their foliage for a longer period of time. It gives them a competitive edge, right? To start out greening out er earlier and stay green longer. And uh, like really prolific, uh, capable of copious seed production. You're talking about 12,000 seeds on a single plant um, and a 90% germination rate. So it's a lot of reasons as to why it is successful. As to how to ID it, I'll show you a video in a second. But I like to think if you are around your kids or grandkids when they were really young, you know, the little baby spoons, <laughs> like how you feed like from with, uh, you know, I don't know, like applesauce or whatever. They look like little baby spoons. They're spatula shaped. Um, you're going to start to see the leaves starting to come out soon and, and start to flower um, in, a, in a little bit, in a little over a month or so. Um, but I just want to show you what it looks like in the field so you might be able to identify it, um, you know, shortly. So this is what, uh, this is just a good look at what it looks like in early spring. You can see this almost flat, very thin spoon-shaped leaves that run along these branches. And you can start to see that there are little flower buds that are starting to appear. This video is being taken in mid-April, but by May, you'll start to see these almost whitish or uh, yellowish flowers that start. So I took this last year, like not, not too far from, you know, this is mid-April is the video. So this is happening soon. Start to come. And they tend to come out by these little leaf clusters here. Um, another, thing that I wanted to point out is that usually by the uh, end of the summertime, you'll start to see these berries, these red berries appear. And these are actually lasting from last year. So these red berries are more oval in shape and um, tend to be more elongated than some of the other ones that we'll see uh, in terms of lookalike. In general, red berries usually signifies an invasive non-native uh, species. Uh, the, it's just, uh, so if you see red berries, oriental bittersweet is a vine that has taken over like a lot of our trees, red berries. Uh, you're, I'm going to show you also uh, multiflora rose, red berries, Japanese barberry, red berries. The, it's not always the case, but it's often the case. And if we can get a close look at what these thorns look like, you see how they go straight up and they almost look like toothpicks. And you can get an idea for scale. If you're taking notes, Japanese barberry, the, 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 the sort of the projection, the spines there, they look like toothpicks. And that's a way to tell it from like a rose or something. Of both of these things from, from my hand and, and fingernail next to it, right? But almost like these very, very thick, sharp ones that had to, uh, sharp thorns that appear at the end of the leaf clusters. So that just gives you a, a, a general look at that. The only other thing I wanted to point out is if you take a look at the base of this, zoom into the base of this, there are multiple um, stems that are arising on this, just this one plant. And again, you know, because it's so dense in the middle, you know, these harbor are lots of ticks. So I got to be careful to check myself afterwards and small mammals and rodents. It's usually multi stems Tend to use this as a uh, cover, which again, you know, provides hosts for some of these ticks. So these are some of the key features. And again, taking a look at, at the, at the arching branches and that almost like wild look to it. And the branches, as they arch, if they touch ground, it can actually sprout up new uh, a new plant entirely. Um, and we'll look take a look at some of the the lookalikes in the area. But again, you're looking for the sharp thorns at the base, the spoon shaped, almost spatula, very thin leaves, and those arching branches. I'm going to go into our next species now because it because it has red berries and it's a good way to to tell the difference between Japanese them. barberry lookalike alert. What we're looking at here is actually not Japanese barberry, but multiflora rose, which is another invasive species with sort of a wild growth pattern to it. So if you're out and about and you see this almost this wildness of growth in those arching branches, it may be multiflora rose. So there's a couple of different things you can look for. Let's take a look at the berries that have persisted over the winter into the early spring here. You'll see that they are red, very similar to Japanese barberry, but they're not nearly as elongated and oval in shape. All right, so they're more- they're These are called rose hips. 
and they look like little maracas, I think, or something, you know, uh, and they have a little dimple on the end. That's a, that's one way to tell. They're a little bit slightly rounded and they have like the black tips at the end, as you can see here. So that's one of the features that can that can help distinguish it. Let's take a look at some other features about multiflora rose that are slightly different. If you take a look at the thorn, to me, that looks like the dorsal fin or so, or of a uh, of a shark or something very different than the toothpick shaped barberry right and oftentimes the thorn will be a different color almost like it looks like it was glued on to the stem whoops just happened there there we go sorry about that Hand so it's more recurved and, and kind of a curve towards the back versus barberry which has a very straight almost toothpick shape to it and if you can see behind that thorn you see um that there is almost what are called these fringed stipules at the base. So if you can see, uh, if I can get my finger in there. See this little fringed, almost like uh, these fringed stipules or the base of the, of the leaf stalk here that connect to, the, to this branch here. It's got those little like hairy projections on it or the what are called fringe. Certainly bar- to me, it looks like a little caterpillar or something, like a little bug at the base of the at the base of the. Barberry leaf. doesn't have that, and this is the distinguishing feature of multiflora rose. So those are some of the features that you can look for to make sure that you're looking, in fact, at barberry and not multiflora rose. So those are two. Again, they're very similar looking, and they're really annoying because they form very dense thickets around us. So. That's multiflora rose. It can grow up to six to 10 feet tall. You're going to start to see this white flowers appear in May and June. Um, but essentially, it's like it, it can really form these impenetrably dense clusters of a shrub um, and something to be on the lookout for. I wanted to um, also point out that, it, that those berries of multiflora rose are utilized by birds. They, they will feed on them. Uh, cedar waxwings, American robins, grouse, pheasants, wild turkeys, they're all common consumers of them. Um, and they're found along pastures, um, you know, in forests, stream banks, and they can tolerate a wide range of conditions. And they do provide nesting habitat, but the, the, in terms of nutritional quality, we're still a little bit unsure about that. Um, and so it's because of these thickets and, and also just the walls that are, are formed uh, by them impacting recreation and hiking. Um, I know to keep our trails open is very difficult in multiflora rose uh, dense thickets. And even they are often found along pastures and stuff and are not good quality um, forage for things like, like cattle and, and on our farms. It can actually lower, lower crop yields in fields um, that, are, that are next to them. That's, due to like chemical composition of how they're influencing soil dynamics. Um, again, just like Japanese barberry, it's propagation by seed um, is, is it's, it's just an incredible reproducer, prolific seed producer up to 500,000 per year from a single plant. And the seeds remain viable for up to 15 years. It can be dispersed by multiple animals. And again, that early leaf out, late, late leaf loss. This was that fringe stipule I was telling you guys about, that sort of caterpillar thing. That's how you tell it from like a na native roses or, or a, a rose that you might find around here. Um, in terms of its management, you can um, pull or dig out small plants, but you gotta, re you gotta remove all of the roots. So cutting the roots uh, and repeat as, needing, as needed. Pruning will only like really stimulate growth and really the recommended time to do that is before the seeds ripen, usually in the late fall. So you build up like it, its energy reserves and puts it towards its fruit. And right as it does that, before the fruit can drop, that's when you want to kind of like trim it back. That's uh, different from uh, slightly man, uh, similar to barberry. And again, you want to pull or dig it out. It's usually about 70 to 80% effective. You can get all of the roots. With both of these wear gloves, um, you know, dispose of them in garbage bags, large plants cut close to the ground, and again, late fall. Um, however, if removal, total removal is the goal, multiple cutting throughout the summer for barberry is most effective. Um, but winter cutting typically tends to encourage new growth and, and not generally isn't encouraged by our organization. 
So we're running low on time, I know. So I just wanted to like, um, uh, I don't have time for bittersweet today, but essentially I wanted to leave you guys with ways to get involved. And I'm willing to stay on for the answer questions. I know you guys may have a lot of questions. There's various ways, like you've learned just about a couple of ways to get involved today. So the spotted lantern fly tree of heaven, what we focused on. There's ways to get in touch with us and go out and help us scout before it becomes a problem like some of these common invasive species that I focused on. Um, our organization hosts a lot of different removal days um, that anyone can participate in. Uh, the removal events this year will be limited to like 10 volunteers at a time, similar to what Jewel was talking about at the beginning. It sounds like the Poughkeepsie Library District is also going to be hosting potentially some own um, removal events, so be on the lookout for that. And then we as an organization also have those and I'll show you how to get in touch with us if you're interested in learning about those, how to sign up for a newsletter or whatever. Um, and you can see like with through efforts of people and volunteers, you can make a huge difference. Like this is just a volunteer removal event of Silver Vine in Sterling Forest, which is near our headquarters and like completely uncovered this, uh, this structure here. So the power of people, you guys can do it. Um, you can also join our Invasive Strike Force survey team. Um, we do monthly scavenger hunt style challenges using some mobile apps, some with, some without. Um, and you can learn how to do that and participate, be part of something bigger and really like give back and also like learn about what it is that you're seeing. Um, lots of people uh, earn community service hours through us, master gardener service hours as well. And uh, the bottom line guys, is if you wanna get involved with our programs to contact us at invasives at nynjtc.org. So again, that's spotted lanternfly stuff, tree of heaven, as well as um, our invasive plant surveys, which will start undergo once the growing season is happening. And of course, be in touch with Jewel and what's happening, all the amazing stuff that's happening up in Dutchess County um, and that the library district is organizing as well. So with that, I know we're low on time, but again, I'm willing to stay on and, and answer any questions you guys have. You've been an amazing audience and um, you know, there's only so much I can cover in a limited amount of time, but I'm glad you guys were here for, to be a part of it. And um, happy to answer questions. I'll turn it over to you, Jewel. Okay, uh, real quick question. Which way does barberry affect the pH of the soil? Do you know, does it raise oh, it? Lower? You know what, I gotta look back on my notes. Um, I don't know okay. off the top of my head, but uh, I can get that answer to you by maybe the end of the call. Let me look at my notes, see if okay. I have anything. Um, why do nurseries still sell these plants that are so, you know, the bar, the Japanese barberry, it's so popular? Speaking as a citizen and not a representative of my organization, I will say that I think it's completely ridiculous. I mean, it's a known, it's a known invasive plant. So right now the regulation in New York state is that um, if it is, if it's sold, um, it needs to have a specific message that's on it um, that says that it's an invasive plant. So at least the consumer knows that it wow. is, that it's invasive, but um, that's essentially, that's essentially what the, the regulation is at this point. Okay. And in terms of getting rid of it, you're saying it pretty much, you just have to dig it out. Yeah. Digging is actually can be very effective. Uh, if you get, if you get all the roots and you really kind of get under it, um, like our, um, our crews that do a lot of the removal, we have seasonal crews that go out and, and engage in these projects and they're doing it almost exclusively through manual means. Uh, they, they do use chemicals as well, but it's not necessary. You can get close down and, and simply dig these, these out. Okay. Well, the main thing is to bag the main thing is to bag it up so that the seeds don't just fall because um, you know that's that's the key is to kind of getting everything controlled and not the seeds like falling otherwise you're just spreading it more. Wow. Yeah, and then put it where you have to take it to the. I mean, it has to be garbage, right? Yeah, it needs to be a land, the it Needs to be landfill. Land the other thing that you can do if you're not if you don't want to do that if you have an area. Uh, like when we are working in remote parts of the forest where they've invaded, we can't haul out trash bags. So you find an open area, like a, like a rock where it just can't sprout up and you dry it out and the seeds will dry out. And if you hang it or, um, and it can't like, the seed can't actually reproduce, um, then, then you've taken care of the problem as well. We usually find like big rocks to lay it out on where it can't sprout up. Okay. 
Uh, which plant would you say is the highest priority in terms of getting rid of invasives? Um, I think it depends on your situation. So most of our management projects are actually not involving the common invasive species. It's really the emerging ones because that's where uh, management success on a, on a bigger scale, we can really make a difference. And that's why I really wanted to highlight the idea of early detection rapid response because that's where the efforts really should be going. But that doesn't, that you can't, that, that is not to say that like the common invasive species, like the ones I talked about at the end of the talk today, um, you know, they can be very, they can be very rare in certain areas. So like you got to go after that. Or if you want to get it off of your property, go for it. Like if there's mm -hmm. only a few on your property, um, then, then try to get rid of it, you know, or, or try to cut it back. I mean, the gentleman that spoke up earlier, like really hit hard uh, tree of heaven and managed to manage to, to push it back. It's really a matter of like how much effort and time and resources you have. We as an organization only have a certain amount of seasonal crew members that are able to go out and do it. So we tend to prioritize projects of emerging species, things like um, spotted lanternfly before they become issues. And that's where our, the, the big success stories happen or in areas where a common invasive species has moved in where it once wasn't and you can like uh, eliminate it. Great. Can you burn any of these? That's a good question. We get that question a lot. And yes, uh, uh, Japanese stilt grass is a type of grass that that that, that certain burning can be effective. Uh, so it's like literally using like blow torches. I've I've heard people use um, burning in a fire. You got to be careful because um, because you know the seeds could like kind of like pop out. It's not something that we tell people to actively do, but I have heard anecdotally has worked. Um, mm -hmm. You know, also laying down, there's there's also other other methods that we've heard about, about like laying down, um, I forgot what it's called, but like, not like tarps, but uh, to kind of smother the growth pattern and stymie the growth and then doing manual removal following that is also mm -hmm. effective with certain species. But a lot of these, it's, it's just, it's timing it right so that you get it after it's put in all its energy into kind of gearing up for the reproductive season. And so it's really used its uh, energy resources towards that. And that's when it's the time to act is like right as it's starting to like, I'm ready to reproduce, get it right then, right okay. before it, right before it. Great. Um, I, I do want to have you speak a little bit about the oriental bittersweet because I know it is really a problem in our sure. area. Sure. Um, so it is seven o'clock and I, I understand that some people may need to jump off the, the call and I understand that. Um, but I would like to capture a little bit about the oriental bittersweet on the recording and uh, that way we can share it with others who couldn't make it tonight. Absolutely. I think I have it in my talk. I, I had a feeling I wasn't gonna be able to get to it, but um, uh, I did put it in there just in case uh, uh, I was able to. Uh, can you guys see my screen? No. Oh, wait, hold on. I must have gone off screen share, okay. All right, just give me a second and you can see it now, right? Yes. All right, so yeah, Oriental Bittersweet. This is what it looks like. So again, highlighting the red berries. If you find a vine that is smothering a tree and it's got these red berries on it and persists throughout the winter, you're most likely dealing with Oriental Bittersweet. So it, um, it's hallmark what it does is it climbs and corkscrews up the trees. And I don't know if you can see in this picture here, and I can play a video if there is time and people want to stay on the call to kind of show you what I'm talking about, but it's new growth on the ground. It almost looks like a snake that's coming up, like a cobra uh, that is coming up and looking for something to purchase and wrap around. You can see that it's coming up here and it's called the leader and it's looking to wrap around something. You also might notice when you're pulling it out, it's got like uh, this, these uh, red orange roots to it. Uh, so that's another sign that you're dealing with an ori oriental bittersweet infestation. So the younger sprouts have this have these leaders that sort of look for purchase, but it's the mature vines that look like these mighty pythons. And you know you're not looking at poison ivy 
because poison ivy will has the has the little hairs and tendrils, the hairy tendrils that it'll attach onto a tree. This is like a python with these dark, and remember how I talked about lenticels? They're like bumps on the vine itself that um that that uh, promote like a oxygen exchange and gas exchange between the, the plant and its environment. So it's usually studded with these like spots on it, but it's really the corkscrewing uh, appearance to it that you know you're dealing with bittersweet. Um, bittersweet leaf identification. So you're gonna start to see it in a little bit. When it's young, it tends to have these pointier edges to it. Um, they're alternating along along as well, but um, it has a point to it. But its main thing is it's got these toothed margins to it. So tooth edges to the leaves. And as it becomes older, you see how it's like a little bit more rounded. The leaves itself are a little bit more rounded. Um, but when it's younger and looking at the sort of like the leaders, it, it tends to be more like, you know, pointier or whatever. In terms of management, you can pull those young vines out by the roots. So when it's in that leader stage, it's a great time to remove it. You can just yank them out of there. Um, and uh, it's really actually not that hard to pull them out of the ground. The larger vines, you wanna cut low to the ground, okay? Um, and anything that's up high within reach, but it's gonna take, it may take multiple cuttings to kill it. Cutting will reduce the damage to the trees. So unfortunately what ends up happening, we have a lot of volunteers that have these like vine cutting events and volunteer removal events. And they, they leave behind the vines because it can actually be really dangerous and next to impossible to pull it out of the trees. So unfortunately, you see a lot of the dead vines that are on the trees, but at the very minimum, it'll stop smothering the tree and girdling the tree and enable the tree to survive. So hopefully its own growth will start to take over again. Again, timing is everything. So July and August before the fruit ripens is the best time to do it. But really, you can kind of cut the vines down at any point. It just means, means that they may come back a little bit stronger the earlier you cut it in the year. Um, so you may just have to do it more often. But um, that's, so that's when we kind of recommend it happening. Um, for those of you who want to stay on the call, I can, um, I can see if I can get out of this and show you. I think I have it, uh, I think I have it to play here as well. I think it's the next thing on my list here, just to see what it looks like in, in the springtime. You see that, coi that coiling around the tree? Okay, so, but this might be good if people wanna see it on the recording later. Here's a good close-up look of the vines of Oriental Bittersweet. And the reason you can tell is it is actually a couple of different ways. You see how it's wrapping around this tree in a corkscrew fashion? So it's twisting and wrapping around, almost like a python that's going up this. It's actually can even wrap around itself. You might even see these dark knobs with, again, a couple of different vines that are wrapping around it itself. Also, I will notice, you will notice that it has a lot of dots on it. Now, it depends on the age of that vine as to whether you'll see those. But those are lenticels and ways of uh, oxygen exchange uh, in inside and outside of the vine. And uh, that's another distinguishing feature of it. You got to look, it's, it's almost like dotted with those. Um, but again, that depends on the vine. You can see that all throughout here. But you're really looking for that corkscrew pattern. I did want to point out that right below it is poison ivy. And again, poison ivy with the three leaves. So there's poison ivy going just below it here. But that's all that twistiness right there. That is classic of Oriental Bittersweet. We are filming this right now at the beginning of May, and you can just see, like even, even the branches that are coming out of this twisting vine here, you can see that the leaves are starting to form. And again, so this is what the leaf structure will look like. You can see that there's little teeth at the edge of the leaf. So that's, that's another classic way to look at it. So, but as this continues to grow and the growing season comes on, you can see that those leaves are growing in clusters. These will open up a bit. And I'm just looking for almost like that, that oval shaped look to it um, with a little, like the tip at the end. Whoops, if it comes back into focus. Yeah, I see this got like comes kind of to a point, but you're looking for the teeth on it. So the teeth on the edge, kind of growing out of this cluster here, but it's really that wrapping around like a big python that you're looking for that distinguishes it from say poison ivy, which tends to meander or even Virginia creeper that tends to meander as well. Look for that coarse growing pattern.
I also wanted to show you a younger version of bittersweet and, and what it looks like. You can see that the that the bark um, on this stem here is a little, um, it's it's like reddish brown. And you can see that the lenticels on this are, are more white or those bumps that you're seeing for um, gas exchange are white. You can see the leaf clusters again. And if you zoom in very closely, you can see that they're two little tipped points on the leaves, okay? So when this starts growing out, you'll see that the leaves are arranged alternately as well. So they're not gonna be opposite of one another um, as this begins to grow out. The other feature of the younger branches that I wanted to point out, we'll go over here. It's a little more obvious. So bittersweet, again, as a vine, is looking for something to wrap around, right? In that corkscrew fashion. So what you'll often see are these things that are called leaders. So you see how this is almost like, it's like a snake kind of perched up like a cobra looking for something. Um, so I, it's sort of like the snake-like appearance. These leaders will come off of the main, you know, the, off of the main stem um, and be looking to wrap itself around something. You can see that this bittersweet here is wrapping around itself. So uh, almost this corkscrew twisting around itself. You can see how it's all tangled. So this is what the younger version of bittersweet will look like. All right, so that's basically what bittersweet, young, old, and you'll see another invasive plant beneath it. That's garlic mustard. <laughs> this is a highly invaded area. I mean, I could talk invasive species all day. We could be here for like a month. So, but this, uh, there's only so many I can talk about in a short amount of time. So. Um, hopefully that that covers what you are looking for there, Jewel. Oh man, yeah, this is this has been great. Thank you so much, Brent. Um, I know uh, we're we're gonna have to we're gonna have to leave you, um, but I do appreciate you taking the time, Brent, to take us through all of this. And again, thank you for the uh, the the um, email. So please, everybody, make sure that you get the email so that you can follow up. And Brent, what website would people go to if they wanna learn a little more about your citizen science program or sign up for your uh, monthly challenges? Yeah, you'd probably wanna to go to www.nynjtc.org. Okay. So that's our, that's our main webpage. And you'll find, just search for, uh, the Google terms would be like invasive strike force. Uh, but you good. can be able to access that from the main trail conference page. And there's lots of different programs you can get involved in. Uh, you know, I, this is just the community citizen science piece, but there's lots, lots of other things you can do. Terrific. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us. And I will be sending out an email tomorrow or uh, early next week with the recording, the link to the recording. So if you wanted to share it with someone, you can as well as I'll be sending links for you to be able to register for upcoming programs in April. Thanks again, Brent Foscarina. We really appreciate it. And thank All you. Right. Good night. Good night.